So our program today is John Bart. He is a Rotarian from the, uh, the Boise Downtown Club. He has a very interesting program uh, that he's going to explain to us today, and he's also going to introduce his fiance here as well. So help me welcome John Bart. Thank you. Can, if I talk like this, can you all in the back hear me? Good, good. I can move around a little bit. Yes, my, my fiance, Marlene Gast, who is also the uh, communications director for this program that we'll be talking about. Um, I want to begin, though, by saying first how pleased I am to be visiting such a large and impressive Rotary Club. Uh, it, it's a real pleasure to see so many people here. Also, I want to mention that Ken Howell is a member of our club. Uh, I just think so highly of him. I think he's going to be a wonderful uh, uh, d district governor, district governor for us. And one of the things he says as he goes around, he'll say this to you when he comes, is if you send me an email, you'll get an answer. If you phone me, I will call you back. And he means it. Uh, and I urge any of you anytime who have an idea about how Rotary can be run better, get, get in touch with Ken. He is a super, super guy. Also, before I start the presentation, I want to say that I am the incoming chair of the Global Grant Subcommittee for the district. So I will be handling applications for Global Grants starting the 1st of July and lasting three years. We are very anxious to get some new Global Grants, and I'm personally committed to helping anyone who wants to write a Global Grant to learn the, the fairly intricate process and be the resource you can turn to. So I urge you to get in touch with us if you have an interest in that area. Okay, I want to talk about Sierra Leone, West Africa today. And um, I think I have got this on right. So Sierra Leone is in West Africa, right there. It's about the size and shape of South Carolina. Uh, the capital, Freetown, has, is the only large city, a couple of million people, a mixture of um, modern, modern cars, terrible traffic jams, uh, right next to terrible poverty. But we don't work there. We, we work out in the countryside. This all used to be tropical jungle. It was it's thought to have been cleared uh, perhaps uh, 150 years ago. It is gently rolling land, as you can see. And we, we work in the small, remote villages, like this one, trying to reduce poverty. Sierra Leone, until last year, uh, for many years, had been ranked by the World Bank as the poorest country in the world. Now it's about 12th poorest. So th this is real, real poverty. Uh, here's another village. And, um, and another showing a, a little bit lusher vegetation. The, uh, th this is just one indication of the poverty. You see lots of schools like this, just thatch and sticks, and the, the thatch doesn't last very long. So our goal has been to increase the standard of living, and I want to spend the rest of the talk uh, describing how, how we do it. As we thought about what a project should be, we, we focused on four questions, which by coincidence happen to spell fuss. The questions are, how feasible is the project? Do, do, will we be able to do what we say we're going to do? How useful will the results be? Will it make a small difference to the people or a big difference? We wanted to make a big difference. Will the project be sustainable? We, we require some donor dollars but after the donor money stops, will the benefits continue? And finally, scalability. If we can show proof of concept through this project, can other people copy the method so that ultimately millions of people are helped? These are the questions we asked, and at the end of the talk, we may come back to this and, and see whether you all feel we have, have uh, answered them uh, convincingly. Okay, I, I want to, to start with, in a fairly general vein by thinking about what makes a functioning community, because that's what we're trying to create here. And, and if you think about it, really a lot of it depends on the jobs. 
adults who are able to work and can work generally do work, and they make more than they need to feed themselves and their family. And those dollars either directly or indirectly support lots of community services like health and education and good roads and access to the internet and so on. That, that's how communities, for example, here work. The problem in a developing country, of course, is the jobs don't exist. That they are subsistence farmers. They, they barely make enough to feed themselves and their family and sometimes they don't make enough even to do that. They certainly don't make a surplus that can be used to support the additional services that are so important. Now many groups come in and focus on those services, typically one of them, like schools or like health, and they often do quite a lot of good while they're there, but eventually they move on, and because there isn't the economic engine, the the benefit that they have done usually doesn't last very long. This is a widely recognized problem. Lots of people have written about it. This is not simply me. Another approach is to focus directly on the jobs. It's to establish viable commercial businesses that will provide high paying jobs. And as those businesses become established, then other groups can be invited in to work on the health, the education, and so on, to do the things they know how to do so well. And then as those uh, services become established, the groups can move on to other villages and the, the jobs, the economic engine, will provide the support to continue the services. This idea can be summarized in three words jobs change everything. And that's the approach we've used. We have focused on jobs first. We're starting now to think about other community services, and that's what I want to tell you about. First of all, though, when, when I say we, I want to give you some idea of, of who we are. Largely, we are a group of six to eight uh, professionals in Sierra Leone, uh, agronomists, uh, high-level uh, managers, uh, who really make this program happen week after week in Sierra Leone. And then there's, there's a smaller group of us, half a dozen, that, that raise the needed funding. We participate in the visioning and we provide logistic support, for example, shipping tractors and fertilizer to Sierra Leone. But this is largely a program for Sierra Leoneans, run by Sierra Leoneans. Okay, on to the business um, that we're, we're establishing. Anybody know what this is? Marijuana. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Marijuana, no, it's not marijuana. That, that might make some money, no? Hemp? No, yeah, well, I figured you'd know. It's, it's cassava. It's cassava, the fourth largest source of carbohydrates in the world, the third largest source of carbohydrates in the tropics after rice and corn. A plant that doesn't grow north of 30 degrees latitude, so most of us don't know it. It hasn't been well studied. It's one of what economists call the neglected crops, a crop that's very important, but we haven't studied it a great deal. But it's grown all over Sierra Leone. And, and we decided to establish a business using modern methods to grow and process cassava. Various parts of the plant are used, but primarily it's known for its tubers, and we make a dried, roasted, granular product called gari, and I'm gonna show you briefly how it's made in, in kind of a traditional way, then I'll talk about how we need to improve the methods. So the first step is to dig up the tubers and carry them to the nearest road and then transport them to the processing center where they are peeled uh, almost exclusively by hand, but, but that's not a viable approach, but, but they, they have to be peeled somehow. Then they are grated, as you can see on the left, and pressed to begin reducing water content. Then they're sieved to remove impurities, and then they're roasted in these, one approach 
is in these flat stainless steel pans that are fired from the outside. Finally, they're cooled and packaged um, <clears throat> and uh, put in these, they're sold in a variety of ways, but one is in these one kilogram uh, bags. <coughs> Another way is to uh, put them in 65 kilogram bags and take them to a large market in the uh, northern part of the country. The, these are trucks full of Gary bound for Senegal, so it, it's a large market. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhat quickly because I, I'm hoping that there will be some discussion afterwards. So what we need to do to improve this process is to bring in mechanized farming, particularly tractors, of course, and we need a modern processing center. And we're seeking money now from Rotary International uh, to establish um, these things. Okay, so that is the business that we're establishing. Uh, we've been studying this for about four years, so really quite intensively. I, I think it's fair to say we know more about producing uh, cassava and, and some of the products probably than, than anybody else in West Africa. So it, it, it's been quite an intensive effort. And, and here are some results focused on this point about we have to provide good jobs for people in the community. We have 180 acres of cassava now. We'll increase that to 250 acres. That will make uh, 4,000 tons of tubers annually, 1,000 tons of this product, Gary. Um, this business has to be managed by somebody from a developed country initially. People in Sierra Leone, many of them are extremely smart and extremely motivated, but they don't have the experience of managing a modern business. And so we have signed an MOU with the Peace Corps under which they will recruit someone to, to come in and manage the business as long as needed. And I don't think we know right now how long that will be. What's an MOU? A memorandum of under understanding, just an agreement. So we project 358,000 in gross revenues, uh, annual income. We will gradually increase the salaries of people working on the farm and in the factory until they are 20 to 30 dollars a day. That's about seven times the rate that they get at present if they can find employment, which most of them cannot. So it's a big increase in salary. It's what's needed for them to be members of the middle class. And if we pay them that rate, then we project having about 100,000 a year left over in profits, half of which will be used to expand the business and half to carry out community projects. So that's our business plan. Um, we, we've made lots of gurry, we've sold it, et cetera. Um, but we do need the, the, the larger tractors and the processing center to really establish a, a going concern. And, and initially we'll have 60 employees and, and we expect that to double every one to two years in, in ways we can talk about later if you're interested. Okay, so that, that's the jobs part of this program. And now I can... Oh, oh can, can you back up over there, so, or maybe I can? Yeah. Now go for. Oh, I can go forward. Can I go forward? forward? Maybe I'm not pointing it right. Oh shoot. Okay, good. Stop. Um, so let's think a little bit more about what it means to be members of the middle class, because as much as we think jobs are the key and the starting point. Our goal is not simply to have a farm or grow and sell Gary or to provide jobs because the people might not use the money they get in wise ways. Our goal is that they become permanent members of the middle class. So what's that mean? Well, in addition to having a job, which, which beyond providing money is a huge sense of satisfaction, it means things like being well nourished, being in good health, having access to good schools and a comfortable home and so on. These are the things we're trying to provide for the people there. 
And I want to spend the rest of the time talking about one of these issues, which is uh, good schools. Switch. So, switch. Hmm? use that one. Yeah. Thank you. So I showed you um, a, a, a really terrible school a little while ago, not uncommon, unfortunately. There are also a lot of schools like this that were built but not using very good methods, and so they've disintegrated. And one of the things, the most obvious thing we want to do is build better schools, and, and this in fact is a school that we built, and it was built to replace that one you just saw. Uh, so we, we did that, we, we know how to do this kind of work. Um, and and we, we found that, that just providing just providing better education, we didn't just build the school, we brought in school supplies and textbooks and we provided scholarships for both students and teachers. And we found within just a few months there were some positive effects. This is a young man named Ali Kamara he was the first person in many years to graduate from primary school with high enough scores that he could go on to secondary school. First time in many years that had happened from his village. So, so there are benefits. Even though we're not, just by working on schools, getting the comprehensive change we want. Uh, I was in the country about uh, six months or a year maybe after this uh, nobody, nobody from the village knew I was there. It was after school. I assumed nobody would be in the school, but I stopped by. But I, <coughs> I heard some, some talking down at the end, uh, end of the school. Oh, good, good Bill. And there were, there were a bunch of kids um, practicing, uh, practicing their lessons on their own with no teacher, because they, they wanted to pass the exam too. And, and believe me, that, that would not have happened with the, the building you saw before. So, so there are some benefits. But I want to talk about the, uh, the education program we want to put into place um, in its entirety. We're now working in a different area. This is the school um, in the village where, where we are, are uh, establishing our factory. And, um, this is, this is the classroom in that, built in that school, and, it, and it's very typical. I've been in dozens, I've been in many schools in Sierra Leone, and they're all like this, they're just bleak. There's nothing on the walls, there's no bookcases, no nothing. So obviously that, that needs to be attended to. Um, here is our overall, overall plan uh, for this particular village. Obviously, we have to refurbish that primary school I showed you. There is a partially built secondary school. Uh, we need to finish that. We have to buy textbooks and school supplies. Then I think the first step, or the next step, will be to bring in two teachers from the U.S., uh, maybe for a semester, maybe then two others come after that, so that they can work with the teachers and introduce more participatory uh, teaching methods. In Sierra Leone, the, the teacher tends to stand up front and just scream at the students. It's the darndest thing I've ever seen. And, and there probably are better ways to help them learn. Within about a year to 18 months, we think we're going to be able to bring high-speed internet right into these villages. It's already in a city about 14 miles from us. There's a big debate right now about who the local providers are going to be. But once that's resolved, all we have to do is build a small tower, and we'll be able to bring high-speed internet uh, right in. And then the last thing I want to talk about is to build even better schools. And this is something we're really excited by. The school I showed you a minute ago is a whole lot better than what they have in many places now. But you know, it's still a concrete box with a metal roof. And, and we think maybe that there are some possibilities to do better. That, that's what I'll finish up with. So we're interested in earth building techniques, techniques that make much less use of cement and rebar and metal and use local materials so that the money you're putting into education 
is going to hiring local people rather than buying and importing resources. So let me show you a few, a few buildings. I've been particularly interested in bamboo and fired clay brick, uh, both of which are available in country. Ne neither of them are used much at all. We had the opportunity early on to work with both MIT and the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and I asked the, the Harvard students to, to give us some ideas for bamboo and fired clay brick. They sent us a bunch of stuff, which I'm not going to go through, but, but just a few <coughs> pictures to give you a sense of where this might lead. And, and I think you, you, can, you can start to get the, the flavor, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, the flavor of a very different school than a, a concrete box with a metal roof. Um, earth building techniques have been used all over the world to build beautiful buildings, uh, such as the ones here. And this is my favorite one, and, and I'm almost done now. This actually is an elementary school. It's an elementary school in Germany built by one of the world's foremost earth building architects. <coughs> and as you can see, it is really something inside. Uh, here's another picture. Now, I've talked to a group called Architects Without Borders about building these sorts of things. Maybe not that fancy. Uh, and they have assured me that if I can provide expenses and say a thousand dollars a month honorarium, I can find an architect to come in and <coughs> excuse me and, and do some really interesting buildings. So this is where we're trying to go with education. We have similar stories for health and, and so on. Um, this will be our approach for trying to, to achieve our goal, which is the large numbers of these people become permanent members of the middle class. Thank you. Do we have time for does anybody have any questions for John? Yes, sir. I'd like to know more about the cassava. Okay. Uh, I assume when you you dig it up yes. to, get, to get the tubers or roots, then uh, do you replant immediately another crop, or do you have two or three crops a year, or and, and then when they grind it and make it all into those little plastic bags, what do you do with it? Okay, yeah. Cassava, <clears throat> cassava is an interesting plant. I say that it's the opposite of a potato. A potato, once it's ready to be harvested, has to be harvested, and then it has a very long shelf life. Cassava is the opposite. When it matures, my voice is going, when it matures, it can then stay in the ground for 18 to 24 months. <coughs> and that's one of the reasons we focused on cassava, because it can provide employment year-round. It needs to be planted at the start of the rainy season, which is in May. So harvest it whenever you want to plant it, plant it in May. Um, it, it's a cutting that is planted, not a seed. Uh, as far as what we do with those packets, they are sold directly to consumers. The, the gari is eaten as a snack food directly, and it's used as a thickener in soups and stews widely consumed. Our, our production will be two and a half percent of what's sold in our market area. So a, a thousand tons is, you know, it's, it's roughly 40,000 tons sold in the area. So widely consumed substance. Yes, sir. You don't need to worry about rotating the crop to something else? That's an interesting soil. question. Um, we are shipping in fertilizer from the U.S. and there have been a number of trials with fertilizer of using, of, of planting cassava year after year after year. The longest one has gone for 30 years with no decline in productivity. The, so the big reason though for rotating is disease. It's to prevent disease buildup. So far that's not been a problem in Sierra Leone. I suspect we'll rotate anyway because we're, we're very conservative. Um, but you don't necessarily have to. Yes? What's the primary language of Sierra Leone? In other words, if you bring uh, US teachers over, is there a communication problem? Um, a small communication problem. There are two main tribal languages 
um, and, and a bunch of others, but everybody knows how to speak an English African language they call Creole, and it's K R I O. There's no French, it's not Creole. Um, and, and like I say, it has an English vocabulary and an African grammar. It's pretty easy to pick up. <coughs> Furthermore, for teaching, Sierra Leone is a former British colony, and so English is the national language. The textbooks are all in English, the government people all speak English. So both in terms of teaching and just real communication, it's an issue, but it's, it's not a showstopper. One yeah. more question from someone? Nancy? Maybe I missed this at the beginning, but who is we? Uh, yeah, hey, were, we. <laughs> were you here when I showed the picture of a whole bunch of people? Yeah, but I, I, I didn't get a, I didn't get a name, group, one more degree affiliated yeah. with. Yeah, I should have said that. Yeah, thanks. I should have said that. Yeah, our group is called Village Hope. We are a 501c3. We're on the web at villagehopeinc.org. And there's a ton of information there about who we are. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Hey, thank you, John. Yeah, my pleasure.